<laughs> yes. But the, and those, those things that happen to you, I think you say at some point that all trauma is pre-verbal. And, yeah. and uh, tra trauma is something that you, you're quite careful in the book to say, look, it doesn't mean that you were, <laughs> you were run over or you were kidnapped. Yeah. That it, it's things l l like not being fed yeah. as, a, as a small no, child. Not, and being, you, and, not being responded to, yeah. Yes. Um, and, and you then take that idea of trauma being something that can happen to a very young child, yeah. and you say, before our minds can make the world, that you know, we make the world that we then live in, he says, but before that happens, the world makes our minds. Yeah. Yeah. And it's those early experiences, for you, are those the things then that you could classify as traumas, that they, they become embedded in the child yeah. and manifest them later in life as something? That's right. How does that happen? How does, it get, how does it get embedded? Yeah, well, first of all, what sort of things are they? And then um, why do they get embedded? So trauma basically means a wound. So trauma is when you're wounded and that wound persists and, and, and has impact in your life later on. So trauma, this is important to distinguish. Trauma is not what happens to you. Trauma is what happens inside you as a result of what happens to you. So I, I was just came back from Budapest. I was there presenting this book on Hungarian. And uh, this is... I don't know who designs this, but I went, you know, one of the things that I have to do every day is swim. You don't want to talk to me if I haven't swum, you know. And uh, I swam this morning already, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> so in Budapest, I was staying in a hotel, and around the corner there's a swim club where I go swimming every morning. Across the street, directly across the street, as far from us as, say, the second row here, is the building where my mother and I lived when I was 11 months old and I nearly died there. <laughs> and she gave me to a stranger in the street on the same paving stones that are still there. And so I didn't see her for five or six weeks. A lot of people know this story. The trauma wasn't that she gave me to a stranger. The trauma is what I made it mean. Now any child, what, what, what can a child make it mean except that I'm being abandoned? <laughs> and who gets abandoned? Somebody who's not lovable. Somebody who's not wanted. So the trauma then is my sense of not being wanted, not being lovable, not being considered important enough. And now that trauma plays itself out in, in, for decades afterwards. So it's not what happened to me as such. Because when you look at it objectively, what happened to me as such was that my mother gave me to a stranger and the stranger took me. Those are both huge acts of love, actually. That's the universe loving this child to take care of it, but that doesn't matter. It's how, what I make it mean. So the wound is then what happens within us. That gets embedded in the nervous system as, me as emotional memory, not as recollection. I don't recall being given to a stranger by my mother because the parts of the brain that recall aren't even online at that age yet. Then it doesn't come online until years later. But the emotional memory of being hurt and being abandoned and, and not being wanted, that's embedded in the nervous system. And then it, then it gets triggered whenever anything even vaguely resembling it later on, decades later, shows up. In fact, if you look at the expression being triggered, it's a really interesting expression. But these days we're, you know, trigger warning, you know. Uh, Don't you trigger me. Well, here's the thing. What can be triggered? For a trigger to do anything, a trigger is a very small little thing. For a trigger to have any impact whatsoever, there has to be an ammunition there, there has to be explosive charge. So when I get triggered, it's not because somebody did something, it's because what they did happened to set off the explosive charge, the emotional baggage that I'm carrying. So if I carry the emotional baggage of somebody who doesn't have a sense of being wanted and being important, Anything later on that reminds me of that will trigger me and drive my behavior. So that's how that trauma works. It's embedded in the nervous system, in the brain, in a form of emotional, subverbal memory. Hmm. Another thing you... By, by the way, I'm sorry to say, one more thing. It's also embedded in the body. So many of you will have had the experience, or if you're a body worker, like a massage therapist and so on, you, you go to a massage therapist, they touch you in a certain part of the body, and all of a sudden you're overwhelmed by emotion. You've had that experience? So that's the body, as Bessel says, Bessel van der Kolk, the body keeps the score. So the trauma is embedded also in the 
in the muscles and in the connective tissues and the nerves. Mm. You, also in the book you make the point that this word trauma, it's difficult to hear it in any way as, other than negative, but the point that you make in the book is that these, the thing, the story you tell yourself or that your body yeah. takes in is meant to help you at the time. At the time, that it's yeah. a, it, and is that why it gets, it, that it gets retained, that in its original form, it's yeah, doing yeah. something positive, but it's yeah. later becomes... Yeah, that's a good point. Tell us yeah, more absolutely. about that, please. Absolutely. So, um, let's take somebody with a diagnosis of personality disorder, you know, borderline personality disorder, one of these diagnoses that don't explain anything. They might describe something, but they don't, they don't explain anything, you know? So one of the characteristics is that they don't trust people. It's just hard for them to form relationships. And they very easily feel hurt in a relationship. Well, th that's a perfectly normal defensive response to a childhood when you were hurt a lot. You shouldn't trust. I mean, why would you want to trust? How could you trust if you were always having a sense of being disappointed and even being betrayed? So that what's called to be a pathological manifestation actually begins as a coping mechanism and it's associated with your survival or um, depression, you know, um, this disease of depression. Well, really? What does it mean to depress something? It means to push it down. Now, what gets pushed on in depression is emotions. But why would somebody push down their emotions? Only because it was dangerous for them to express it or unacceptable for them to express it. In other words, they listen to a lot of parenting experts who tell people to tram, you know, to, 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 to suppress children's emo emotions if, if the emotions aren't acceptable to the parents. Then the child, in order to survive, will suppress their emotions, will depress them. That's a survival technique associated with being accepted and, and then being part of the family, which is something the child cannot do without. Yeah. So once you associate something with survival, you're going to keep doing it, especially since it's unconscious. It's not like you chose to do it. It's just that, you know, this is how your organism survived, by depressing your emotions. Now you're going to keep doing that. In fact, you'll be afraid not to. And later on, you're diagnosed with this disease, but it begins as a coping mechanism. And there's so many others of these coping mechanisms that are associated with uh, survival, and therefore um, we don't give them up because if we, if something, if our survival depends on being a certain way, if that's what we learned, we're not going to give it up that easily. Especially as you point out, children have very few options. Yeah. You know, the, the, the ones that are built into us as mammals, it's yeah. fight, flight, or, or freeze. Yeah. Well, if you're, a, if you're a baby, you can't fight. Yeah, and you, it's very difficult to run away, so yeah. it doesn't leave you with much, does it? Except, as you say, just to freeze and... Yeah. And it's that need for attachment. This is uh, a word so, that you deal yeah. with a lot. Tell us about attachment. So this is a conflict that is probably central to my work um, in, in, in all manner of conditions uh, and in all, in all kinds of situations. It's a very powerful dynamic in adult relationships, for example, is that the, the child um, has an absolute need to belong to the parents and to be cared for by the parents. That drive to be close to somebody in order to be taken care of or to take care of the other, for that matter, is called attachment. And mammals um, are creatures of attachment. They can't survive without attachment, without the caring relationship. Obviously, the young cannot survive. So attachment, that's fine. But then we have this other need that's, um, <clears throat> that's also determined by evolution, which is I call authenticity. And just out of the self's authenticity, being in touch with ourselves, being in touch with our feelings and our bodies and our emotions. Um, I know last time I spoke here, I think I asked the same question, but let me do it again. Um, I think I did. If you've had the experience of having a strong gut feeling about something and ignoring it and then being sorry afterwards, just raise your hand, okay? Well, see the vast majority. What, what, you, what you're telling me here is about your childhood. Mm. 
because gut feelings are essential for survival. We evolved our terrain nature. For millions of years, the humanoid, an the humanoid ancestors of our species lived out their nature, as did our own species live out in nature for most of our existence as a species. Like out of the 150, 200,000 years that Homo sapiens has walked the earth, if that can be represented in one hour, then until about five minutes ago, we lived out there in nature. How long does any creature in nature survive if they're not in touch with their gut feelings? So that being in touch with our bodies and, and, our, and our emotions is essential also. Terrific. But what happens is if for the sake of fitting with the family or with a culture that doesn't particularly support our authenticity, we have to give up our connection to ourselves, our authenticity, for, for the sake of attachment. Then being inauthentic, being out of touch with ourselves, is how we survive. We're afraid to be ourselves because we associate being ourselves with the threat of being rejected. And so this means that for the rest of our lives, we're going to be in relationships where we're afraid to be ourselves, to really say what it feels like for us. Now, that has terrific implications. When I say terrific, I mean significant implications. A study I quote in the book, they followed 2,000 women over 10 years. Over a 10-year period, those women who were unhappily married and didn't express their feelings were four times as likely to die as those women who were unhappily married, but they did talk about their feelings. So, so that inauthenticity, which is not a moral, not a moral judgment on my part, it's a, something people do in order to survive their childhoods, but that exacts a major cost in terms of physical and mental health, not to mention your relationships, um, where you're afraid to be yourself, where you're in a relationship and you don't even, you're, they don't even, your partner doesn't even know you because you're afraid to be yourself. So you feel alone even when you're partnered, because if you're not known, you're going to feel alone. It doesn't matter how many people surround you. So, it, you know, the, the price that we pay for an authenticity is huge, and yet so many of us survived our childhood, and when you put your hand up, I mean, have you ever met a one-day-old baby that wasn't in touch with their gut feeling? Oh, uh, I'm tired, and I'm hungry, and I'm uncomfortable, and I'm wet, but mom and dad are working so hard, I better not <laughs> cry. I better not cry. You know, come on, you know? In other words, when you put your hand up, something happened between the day you were born and a few years later when you no longer listened to your gut feelings because you couldn't afford to. Something happened. In a way, one of the things which come across very strongly, especially in the early part of the book, is that we tend to think that children learn things when we teach them, when they get to school or when yeah. we can have a conversation yeah. with them. And very strongly in the book, what comes across is that children become who they are and learn their first, their first moral language, as it were, before any of that. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you think to yourself, I shall wait until the child can speak and then I'll teach them. It's too late. They've already learned everything from what you did or didn't do. Yeah, that's right. So the, the, the um, and, and as, as a parent, because I was quite out of touch with myself and based on my own history, I was never comfortable playing, playing with kids. I kept thinking, well, once they learn language, because I'm good at words, you see. So I thought once they learn language, then I'll be able to. But I missed the whole point is that the uh, real development happens before words even come along. The, 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 the emotional part of the brain, the, the holistic, you might say more feminine, although it's not gender determined at all, um, holistic, um, the emotional part of the brain, the right side of the brain, both in terms of the evolution of the species, but also in terms of the development of the individual, the right side of the brain, the emotional brain develops first. And it's the template for everything. Mm. If we get the right side of the brain right, the left brain will follow very nicely. If we don't get the right side of the brain, if we don't establish the emotional relationships which children require for healthy development, then they might become very uh, intellectually developed on the left brain side, but they'll be very underdeveloped. There won't be a proper template for it. And then they're going to be professors and all that kind of stuff, you know? <laughs> Or philosophers, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or medical doctors, for that matter. 
so that in, in this culture the um, the left brain really rules but the left brain um, the, um, divorced from a healthy emotional underpinning where does it get us hmm. it gets us to where we are which is we're the only species we're the only species that creates environments that are destructive to its own species hmm. That's where, the, that's where the left brain has got us, because the right brain is underdeveloped. And it, and it can't speak. I mean, you, you can't... Yeah. In some way, you don't have verbal access to the lessons, that yeah. first language you learned yeah. before, by the time you were six months old. So how does that part of us speak to us when we won't listen? It speaks to us through our... Um, see, here's the thing. That's, here's the other thing. We think that we have this one brain up here, and what's a brain? A brain interprets stimuli from the environment, processes them, and responds. That's, that's what a brain does. So yeah, we have this cerebrum up here. But there's also, a, a, it turns out, there's a brain connected to the heart. There's a nervous system um, that surrounds the heart, which is in communication with this brain here. And of course, the gut has been called the second brain. The gut has more, some, some more neurochemicals than the brain does in some ways. And gut feelings are not um, luxuries, as we've demonstrated. They're actually a form of knowledge. So the gut is processing stimuli from the environment. When these three brains are in sync with each other, then you have true wisdom. Then you have true awareness. When this one is unmoored from the other two, you can have all kinds of logic and all kinds of science and all kinds of technology, but you're not going to have wisdom. Mm. 